All right, hello everybody. Um, good evening and welcome to uh, this year's uh, Engineering Senior Design Project presentation. Um, I'm James Brooks, I'm a professor of electrical engineering and I'll be uh, this evening's moderator for Channel D. Um, this evening we have two, uh, two projects to present to you in this, in this channel. Uh, the BPMI valve project um, advised by Dr. Blair Allison will go first, uh, followed by the autonomous delivery robot project, um, which I advise uh, starting at 645. Um, we have third, a third uh, projects or a third uh, group of projects to present at 730 in channels A and B. Uh, so I encourage you to switch over to those channels uh, there at the end for the last set of presentations. Um, reminder for students, when you're presenting, be sure to turn on both your camera and unmute yourself. Um, and then whenever you're finished uh, and passed on to the next student, be sure to, to mute both your microphone and your camera. Um, we'll take questions for each group at the end, so feel free to, to hold your questions there. You may use uh, the chat for your questions uh, or just jump in, unmute your mic uh, and ask questions of the students um, as you see fit. All right, so with that, I'll turn it over uh, to the BPMI Valve project. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Hello, uh, my name is Evan Komlenik. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, for our presentation. We're excited to present uh, the material that we have for you uh, that we've been working on this, this semester and all the progress that has been made. This project uh, was tailored for BPMI, Bechtel Plant Machinery Inc. Uh, they have been a great company to work with. This project has been in the making for a few years now and we're very excited and glad to be able to talk about the progress and the project coming to completion. Giving a quick overview of the project, we were tasked with building a device to test the fatigue life of a valve and also record key information along the way while opening and closing the valve. BPMI supplied us with a valve uh, that we were able to base our rig design and functionality as well. Some of the key features for the project were being able to have our rig be adjustable for different size valves. Most importantly, in the vertical direction, but also being able to accommodate larger size wheels for the valve that open and close. As the valves get larger in size, also being able to apply a maximum of 50 foot pounds of torque was necessary for this project. Our team was composed of five mechanical engineers and two electrical engineers. We decided that it would be best to break up into two sub teams for the prog project. For the mechanical team was focused on the design and the manufacturing of different parts that would be needed to complete the project. The PLC HMI sub team was composed of people that would work more towards the coding and also the electrical work of the project. I'll now turn it over to Nate Carver who will talk about the design process. So as Evan mentioned, our team wasn't starting from scratch since this project existed last year, but it was left unfinished from a senior design team. Now the team last year was able to construct a large portion of the rig, which really jump-started our design process for this year. And during the design process, our mechanical team was constantly making sure that any design modifications we were planning on making wouldn't impact the rig's portability, its stability, and also its ability to house various size valves. So as I just mentioned, the team last year did make uh, substantial progress, but many of their designs were left unassembled and untested, especially due to COVID. So before we dove into our specific design modification to the rig, we wanted to test and verify that the designs from last year functioned properly towards their design purposes. And one of the designs from last year were the expanding plugs, as you can see pictured on the left. Uh, these were used in order to secure the valve to the stand without the need to weld. And the picture at the bottom shows the components of the expanding plugs. 
So once we tested and verified that the expanding plugs function properly, we were then able to fully assemble the pipe stand to the valve together, which created a connection similar to how the valve would be set up for actual operation. Now with the valve being secured and knowing that the torque we were going to apply would be applied directly to the hand wheel, we were then ready to begin our specific team's design modifications. Now, our first design modification was adding a device to better measure the torque being applied to the valve, as Evan mentioned earlier. After extensive research, our team decided to purchase a Kistler Type 4520A torque sensor, which is designed specifically for measuring torque on rotating shafts. Now, this sensor had a measuring range of up to 100 newton meters or about 73 foot pounds, which was large enough for the torques we would be applying to the valve based on the valve specs. Now with this torque sensor selected, we needed shaft couplings that would allow us to attach the torque sensor to the shaft. We chose to purchase bellows couplings from Kistler, which can be seen in the photo at the right, attached above and below the torque sensor. The model we chose were rated up to 150 Newton meters or 110 foot pounds of torque. Now an additional reason that our team chose the bellows couplings is because they are made of highly flexible high grade stainless steel that could compensate any slight axial, radial, and angular misalignment of the shaft assembly. And this really provided our team with some reassurance that any slight misalignment of the assembly wouldn't likely damage the sensor itself, but would be handled by the couplings. Now the next task our mechanical team faced was designing an assembly that could attach the torque sensor to the rig. And this assembly needed to be extremely rigid in order to eliminate the risk of damaging the torque sensor, the valve, and the rig itself. So we decided to design a plate that would attach to the underside of the top stage, forming a right angle that could house the various components required to implement our new torque sensor. As seen in the exploded assembly drawing on the left, these components of the right angle assembly included the torque sensor spacing block labeled number 13, the torque sensor labeled number six and the bearing block name labeled number 11. The torque sensor spacing block was used for alignment of the torque sensor to the input shaft. The bearing block provided radial alignment to the shaft and eliminated any moments from forming. Our team also decided to add two collars which attached to the shaft on each side of the bearing block to reduce any axial stress on the ball bearings, which can be seen in the photo in the bottom right. Our team also had to cut the shaft into three sections in order to connect our design components. The first section of shaft, labeled number four, ran from the gearbox into the first coupling. The second section, labeled number seven, ran from the second coupling through the bearing block into a two-piece keyed shaft coupling. And the third section ran from the two-piece keyed shaft coupling into the valve gripper. I'll now turn it over to another member of the mechanical sub team, Andrew Kavnoski, who will talk more about the designs of the top stage plate. Hi, Hi I'm Andrew Kavnoski, and I'm going to be talking about the addition of a thicker top plate. So last year's capstone team had a top stage plate that was half an inch thick. We decided with the addition of our new right angle plate that a more rigid member was going to be needed. A uh, finite element analysis was performed on the top plate in order to ensure that the plate would be able to hold the addition of the right angle plate. The forces were added in Excel, which is seen to your left, that are distributed mainly at two locations. The first location is a radial load set that is related to the weight of the shaft, the gearbox, aerotech, gripper palm disc, and the gripper finger rod. The second set was a downward force caused by the attachment of the right angle plate. This load incorporated the weight of the bearing block, spacer plate, torque sensor, and bearings. The stage was modeled as a cantilever beam in Creo parametric, along with the constraints of the 8020 beams on either side, and this is viewable to your bottom right. The model ended up producing a max stress of about 100 pounds per square inch, which is well below the yield strength of arches and material, which is aluminum 6061. And that has a yield strength of 56,000 PSI. 
After reviewing the results of our finite element analysis, it could be confidently concluded that our stage would support the forces exerted on it while minimalizing any moments or forces that could skew the data being collected by the torque sensor. Uh, T-nuts were then used to attach this plate to two inch by two inch 80-20 members on the rig, and that photo is viewable to your right. The top plate was designed to maximize adjustability while also maintaining the alignment of the right angle plate and the shaft, which is viewable to your top right. The stage is able to be moved front and back along the 8020 rails. And also, the it features machine, machined slots mounting the plate to the 8020 frame, which allows it to move side to side. The incorporation of adjustability maximizes our proficiency of locational tolerancing while also allowing for maneuverability within a limited volume of workspace. The top plate was elevated to 18 inches above the top of the cart to allow room for this new installment of the torque sensor assembly. A shaft coupling is also used at the bottom of the shaft to allow for the bottom shaft to be increased or decreased in length, and the coupling can be viewed at the bottom center of the screen. This coupling features a single key that mates the two sections of the shaft that have keyways in them both. The changing of the shaft length allows different sized valves to be accommodated. The actual picture of the top plate can be seen in the bottom right. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Josh Ibeck and he's going to talk a little bit about machining and tolerancing. Yeah, so my name is Josh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the tolerancing and manufacturability of our design. So the first thing that we took into consideration was the manufacturing claim from the bellows couplings. So they can withstand a, um, an axial misalignment of 0.2 millimeters, which is about seven and a half thousandths of an inch. This means that we had to consider the buildup of each tolerance concerning the location of the shaft. This made it critical to create reference edges and tolerance off them accordingly. The picture in the lower right is a picture of the drawing for the top plate, which gives a visual to dimensioning off certain edges. The first two main components to keeping axial misalignment uh, alignment, sorry, were the dowel pins and the center hole where the right angle plate will drop through. The dowel pins were designed asymmetrically for ease of assembly and to ensure that the assembly would always have the correct orientation. They were designed to have one end press fit and the other end slip fit. This means that one end of the dowel pin will essentially be attached to the plate. And in this case, it was attached to the top plate. The right angle plate would have corresponding slip fit holes that the dowel pin can slide tightly into place. The last major factor in keeping this alignment was the thickness of the torque sensor plate. As Nate mentioned previously, this plate is used to align the torque sensor with the input shaft. The picture in the top right shows this plate under the torque uh, under the blue torque sensor. We decided that before we should machine the torque sensor plate to the design thickness, we should measure the actual alignment of the shaft, taking into consideration the parts that had already been machined. This was done using gauge blocks, which are precision ground blocks used for high accuracy, and a dial indicator to measure the height of the center line of the input shaft as it comes out of the right angle gearbox. We also measured the height of the torque sensor center line to find this difference in height. The torque sensor plate was then machined accordingly to these measurements to limit the stress on the couplings. Uh, once all of our parts had been machined, we are ready for the physical assembly. The bearing block was designed to have bearings press fit into it, so we had to make sure that they were perfectly in line before we began. As you can see in the picture to the right, um, there are two bearings and a spacer in the middle. The spacer is in place to make sure that the bearings don't creep inward over time. To make sure that the two bearings were aligned prior to pressing them into the bearing block, we lightly pressed them into place by hand and we ran a piece of the shaft through both bearings to eliminate any possible angular misalignment that could have occurred if we would have pressed them in separately. When assembling the rig together, we tighten the couplings to the rated 70 Newton meters using a torque wrench. We recommend that this torque value is checked after each long cycle test to make sure that there's no slipping or potential loss of torque that is being transferred to the torque sensor and could possibly skew the data. Another recommendation we have would be to lubricate the shaft if it's stored in a humid location for a long period of time. The team last year purchased a 30 millimeter carbon steel shaft, which was a cheaper option, 
and we noticed a significant amount of rust buildup where the shaft had been sitting inside of the right angle drive. This layer of rust is depicted in the picture in the top right. Um, this could be easily fixed with proper lubrication and shaft maintenance or the selection of a more rust resistant steel shaft. Uh, in order to protect anyone near the rig during operation, a safety case was deemed necessary. The safety case was developed from last year's senior design team and its purpose was to eliminate the risk of pinch zones during operation. It was also designed to allow easy access to the valve and the shaft when it's not operating. The cage would trip the emergency stop if it was open for any reason during testing. So as you can see in the picture in the top left, the safety cage is closed and it eliminates all risks of pinch zones. And the picture in the top right shows the accessibility that the cage permits when it's not in operation. We also implemented a removable wire mesh safety cage for the torque sensor assembly. This was implemented because the couplings will be spinning during operation and we want to minimize any potential safety risks involved with them. The mesh also has a small opening for the torque sensor wire, so it can be set up without removing the entire wire mesh cage. Uh, I'm now going to hand it over to Kevin Ballantyne, who's going to talk about uh, controlling the rig. Hi, my name is Kevin Ballantyne, and I am the PLC HMI subteam leader. And as the leader, I wanted to make sure that we achieve our goals of convey, uh, controlling the mechanical components and conveying information to the user. So to do that, uh, we wanted to account for three separate kind of goals. We wanted to automate the motor and actuator with the fixed velocity, um, which would increase consistency and convenience for the user. Um, we did that by, um, you can see in the picture on your right, in the cage is the valve with the wheel, um, and then the torque sensor and the gearbox and motor all work together um, to automate that. Um, the other, another goal was to graphically display the data um, on the HMI, which you can see there. And we also wanted to allow the user to change the parameters to fit their needs, such as the shaft rotation speed, the number of cycles, and more. Um, so our two main processors are the PLC and the HMI. So our PLC, or our Programmable Logic Controller, is basically a ruggedized computer. Um, the one that last year's team chose is an Allen Bradley Compact Logics 1769 with embedded analog I.O. We used the Ethernet ports for communication and the analog inputs for the torque sensor. The program that corresponds with the PLC is Studio 5000, which is Alan Bradley's um, program that uses an, a ladder logic form of coding as opposed to regular lines. The HMI, or the Human Machine Interface, is a touchscreen panel that both displays and receives information. Last year's team chose the Alan Bradley Panel View Plus 7. Since both the HMI and the PLC are made by Alan Bradley, both these components are very compatible and correspond in very convenient ways. Um, the software that directs the HMI is Factory Talk View Machine Edition, um, which connects very well with Studio 5000. The HMI is where the user will input information and receive information from the rig. I'm now going to hand it over to Jason to talk about our communication hierarchy. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jason and I'll be talking about how each of our components work together to control the valve tester. Uh, the user does most of their work, uh, I should say all of their work on the HMI touchscreen, which moves through the communications hierarchy to turn the motor and open and close the valve. Uh, the bulk of our programming resides in the PLC and the Soloist Motion Controller from Aerotech, but there are important commands that also reside in the HMI as well, uh, all of which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide. So the first step uh, in controlling the rig happens between the HMI and the PLC. 
The user uses numeric inputs and buttons that are on the HMI touchscreen uh, to manipulate the values of tags residing in the PLC code. And when I say tags, I am simply referring to uh, just another word for variables that are within the code in the PLC. So after the user has changed those variables in the HMI, uh, such as the motor speed or the number of test cycles they desire, uh, the PLC is then able to deliver that information over to the Aerotech Soloist Controller's global registers. Uh, the Soloist then reads this information and uses it within its code to turn the motor and valve accordingly, based on parameters determined by the user. Um, I'll now be handing it over to Evan, who's going to describe how our user interface operates on the HMI. Thanks, Jason. So for this project, having a user friendly interface was very important and something that we did not want to cut corners on. Keeping the displays simple and easy to follow was kept in mind while developing these screens. One criteria for this project was that somebody could operate the test with practically no training. Uh, this is why so much time was spent on this aspect and something that we wanted to ensure we had clear and easy to follow instructions and displays for the user. The general design of these screens and layout was started with last year's BPMI valve testers team. We were able to pick it up where they left off implementing new ideas and making sure that everything that was on them fit what we were going to accomplish this year. Shown on this slide are the four main screens that the user will be able to see while setting up and while monitor monitoring the test. The setup screen and the run screen will get some more detail on the next two slides. Um, if we look at the far left on the information screen, this is where the user will be able to see instructions on how to set up the test and run the test. There are also buttons on the bottom of every screen for easy navigation between the different screens. If we look at the alarm screen, this is where the user will be able to see any faults or alarms that come up while setting up the test or while the test is running. This could include things such as the emergency stop being pressed, the safety cage door being opened, which Josh talked about earlier. It could be an over torque that was recorded while the test was performing, or it could be that somebody inputted a parameter that was not within the range specified on the setup screen. The setup screen is the next screen we'll look at in detail. While the main focus of this project was to design a rig that would test the fatigue life of a valve, we have the parameters set up in such a way that this can vary in a, in a slight manner, depending upon the motor speed selected, the pause time, or the number of cycles, different tests can be performed for different situations. Uh, the testing parameters are the number of cycles, the overall torque limit, the pause time, and the motor speed. And these are all inputted by the user while setting up the test. Things to note, for motor speed, the user would be able to input a 1 for the slowest speed of 5 RPMs, a 2 for a medium speed of 10 RPMs, or 3 for a higher speed of 15 RPMs. Also, the pause time should be inputted between a range of 5 to 60 seconds. These were things outlined in the project requirements when we received them. On the setup screen, there are also control buttons. Um, these are the reset parameters, which will clear the inputted values to the displays seen in the middle of the screen and a stop button for safety. Going on to the next slide, we'll be able to see the run screen. This is the screen that the user will most likely be on while the test is happening. Here he'll be able to monitor most of the data and ensure that the test is performing properly and that the fatigue life of the valve is as expected. Uh, seen on this screen is a graph of a torque versus time, and we'll be able to see a live demonstration of this later. Uh, there are also test control buttons, which includes a pause, unpause, and the start and stop. The start button takes you to a double check screen, a screen which allows the user to ensure that they want to proceed with the test, making sure that it is not started prematurely. There are also visual indicators on the screen, which will tell the user when the valve is opening or closing, 
and numeric displays as well for the torque magnitude, the cycle that is currently on, uh, max torque, and also the average torque rec recorded while the test is performing. I'm now going to pass it over to Andrew Wisniewski, who's going to talk about some of our data collection. Hello, I'm Andrew, and I'll be talking about the, the data collection and testing. First, to look at the data collection, we were originally going to use the built-in SD card that is built into the PLC. However, using this brought up some challenges of its own of not being able to completely able to read things off the SD card. So we began brainstorming a different way to do it. And one way that we came up with was to use an Arduino Uno that would allow us to be able to send the information from the Arduino Uno into a text file that would be able to be able to sa be saved onto the computer. However, this also brought up some complications with themselves. However, we were able to um, complete these complicate complications with um, one of these being that the torque sensor outputs plus or minus 10 volts and the Arduino Uno analog pin can only take zero to five volts. So to fix this problem, what we decided to do was construct a circuit of two op amps as shown in the figure on the top right. The first of which will take the, the plus and minus 10 volts and shrink it down to be within a range of about plus or minus two and a half volts. The second op amp then will shift this voltage up from plus or minus two and a half to be between zero and five volts, which is the needed area of it to read into the Arduino Uno, where zero would act as negative 10 volts and five volts would act as positive 10 volts. From here, we also ran into another challenge that Arduino does not normally allow you to be able to save information to a text file. So we downloaded another software called Cool Terms, which is, allows you to print information from Arduino to its software and then save that information to its own text file. So now that we're able to save the information to a text file, we are then able to implement it into various softwares. The software that we decided to use was MATLAB. And with MATLAB, we were able to find the max torque, the average torque, and even as shown in the bottom right figure, we were able to plot the data over time so we can see the changes whenever the torque is opening the valve and closing the valve. Next, we will look at the actual testing of the rig of where we, whenever we were trying to set up the code for the PLC, HMI, and Solus, we began by just running short two to three cycle tests to make sure the new code that we were implementing was running properly. If we ran into some errors, we were able to quickly resolve these errors and run another two to three cycle test to allow and to ensure that we were correctly correcting the things that needed to correct it. Once we were, once we were sure that our program was significant to run a more rigorous test on it. We ran tests from 50 to 100 cycles. And as we ran these tests, we noticed a change in some of the behavior of the valve, such as the longer we ran the test, it began to slowly increase the max torque required to open and close the valve. So with this, and due to not having proper lubrication for the valve, we did not want to test the limits of the valve. So we decided that we were only going to run up to up 100 cycles. Next, we will be looking at a demonstration video for how the HMI screens look whenever they are in run mode. All right, so we don't have sound of this video, so I'll be able to take you through kind of what's happening here. This video was captured in Factory Talk View, which is the programming environment uh, for our HMI screens. We didn't have a way of clearly showing you our actual screen, uh, but this software is capable of simulating exactly what the user sees during the test. Uh, so right here, we're changing values on the setup screen uh, for the parameters for the test. And once that's complete, we'll be able to head over to the run screen. And once the user is ready to run the test, they'll hit the start button, which is then going to take them over to the Are You Sure screen, which they'll confirm the parameters that they want to run their test. And once they select yes, they can go back to the run screen from there. 
and it will show the test running. So there's a live feed of what the torque sensor is reading on the torque versus time graph, as well as a current torque magnitude, which is shown by the numeric indicator. Uh, we have the max torque observed that updates as the torque uh, finds a new max, uh, as well as the average. Uh, we also have the little green lights up in the top left hand corner, which indicate the direction the valve's turning. So that was our demonstration video. We'd just like to give a special thanks to Dr. Allison for being a great advisor, Derek Stevenson and the BPMI team that we were able to communicate with and get a lot of help. Uh, also, Jim Pache and the shop staff as well for all of their work and effort in getting our parts machined and for just being there for all the last minute things that needed to be done. Um, are there any questions at this moment? Great, thanks guys, appreciate that. Um, so we have about 10 minutes. So uh, folks in the audience, other students, uh, feel free to ask any questions. Again, you can use the, the chat uh, panel if you'd like, or you just go ahead and unmute and, and ask your question directly. Hi, this is uh, Blair Allison. Just a question for you. The uh, the audience may not know, but the the main frame that supported a lot of the hardware that was added to it for this application, that main frame was uh, just reused from a former project. Um, if you were to start from scratch, or if, for instance, BPMI was going to uh, build one of these. Would you make any recommend? Could you make any recommendations as to how you might change the the basic structure of the of the system? The uh, you know, would it look much different than it does now, or would you recommend going with something that was pretty much like what what you ended up uh, producing? Yes, I can answer that. I think this is something that the team discussing and obviously as the project progressed uh, finding out more information about the valve setup and exactly how BPMI would like to use it would determine that slightly so obviously having the rig be portable and able to adjust the different size valves I don't see that aspect of it changing drastically I do think that the cart design could be condensed uh, to make it more efficient uh, for space and also easier to move Possibly also knowing that the valves would only go up to a certain height if they were able to have a specified zone for testing the valves could also lower the overall height of the top stage. But as far as the overall design, if it is supposed to be movable and um, connect to the valves, then I think that the overall design is, is fairly sufficient. Great, thank you.
Uh, you guys shared that the uh, PLC was communicating with the Aerotech motor controller via global registers or something to that effect. Could you could you talk a little bit more about that interface? Sure, I can answer that. Um, so within the ladder logic code in the PLC, uh, we have what's called message rungs. And those message rungs initiate a command um, based on the IP address of the Aerotech controller. And it sends through Ethernet to that IP address information containing uh, specific tag data, which you also specify in that line of code. Um, once that is that message wrong has been executed, um, the Aerotech is able to read those registers through lines of code. There's a command within AeroBasic, which is the programming language of the Aerotech, to open up and read the message from the PLC. And once that's been open and read, it stores the data in specific registers and is then able to use those values through code. OK, great. So that's a that's a dedicated Ethernet link between those two. That's not over an open network, right? That is not over an open network, correct. And what is the what is the rate of those messages? Like how quickly can you reliably send commands that way? So we have we have them on uh, an R setup right now operating every 100 milliseconds. Um, I ne we never tried anything quicker, but I believe we can go as fast as 25 milliseconds. Every 25 milliseconds, we can send those back and forth. Okay, great, thanks. All right, are there other questions for these guys? If not, I guess I'll ask another one. I'm curious to, to hear about the, uh, the valve degrading over a relatively short number of cycles. Um, did you have discussions with BPMI about that? What was their reaction to the fact that the valve seemed to have a uh, relatively short life? Yeah, so I'm um, talking with BPMI. I think the biggest concern was just trying to push the valve for more than we really should have for the um, situation and the conditions it was under. Um, as far as seeing the increase in torque levels or the maximum torque, we weren't totally sure if that was just due to us thinking that they should have been at a predetermined lower level from what we were used to. Um, it could have been something as almost of like working in the valve in a sense. And so um, we didn't have the correct lubrication due to uh, time span, uh, getting that and being able to still perform a longer test. And so it was just a safety precaution. Um, like I said, we weren't you know, we don't want to say it was degrading because the valve is in good condition um, and there were no obvious signs of wear, but without having all the necessary uh, precautions, we didn't want to, to risk anything. So um, there, there wasn't a huge amount of concern there. Yeah, Evan actually ran that past me a few weeks ago, and I appreciate you guys uh, monitoring that fairly closely. Um, that what we provided to to this group was a it, it's a commercial valve um so it's it's not our most uh robust valve that we use in our program um but <clears throat> nonetheless we do appreciate um you guys you know taking care of it and and providing it back to us in in a condition that's you know ready to be used again so i appreciate your guys's your guys's work um and and the monitoring during during the testing that you guys did so thanks no problem. 
If a uh, U.S. team would have another year to work on this project, where do you see it going uh, past this point? Were there any testing procedures or uh, case studies that you were not able to get to this year that you'd like to revisit, given a long, given a longer time frame? So, I think besides working on the coding side of the project. Um, is something that would always be able to improve, um, become more efficient. And as far as the mechanical design of it, I don't think that it would um, drastically change. I think we were set with the task of bringing a prototype, a general design that would that would work for um, that would lead lead to other things for other size valves, um, but. But no, I, I don't think that uh, in a year's year's time um, that anything drastically different would happen with it. Um, our, our prototype was something that we're happy with. We think that uh, depending upon the specific application, it'll be useful and um, helpful. Excellent, thank you. Hi, this is Blair Allison again. Um, one other question. The, one of the purposes of capstone design projects is for you to uh, put into practice some of the things that you've learned over four years here, but also a big part of it is learning to work as a, on a team. Um, can you just mention any lessons learned along those lines? Um, things that work really well in terms of teamwork, uh, things that perhaps you um, you know, were surprised by, you know, any any lessons in terms of teamwork? Um, I can answer that one. Um, one of the things I think it was really valuable through this project in terms of teamwork was um, sometimes looking at the bulk of the work we have to do and just how many tasks there are to complete. It's very easy to very quickly become overwhelmed and take too much upon yourself to think you have a lot more to do. And it's okay to rely on your teammates sometimes. It's okay to divide the work accordingly. And just, it's very helpful to not always feel overwhelmed about that and knowing you have a team behind you. Great, thanks. All right, we have time for maybe one more question. Anyone else want to uh, to engage with the team? OK, all right, great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your work. Thanks for sharing it with us this evening. Uh, nice job.